I don't believe in honorable mentions, so we're going to use the 50 spot to acknowledge Garrett Cole. He's currently scheduled to miss a couple months with elbow troubles, but I think there's plenty of pessimism he could miss much more than that. Given his timetable, it's unlikely he'll put up top 50 value this year, but he'd be ranked at number 15 if he was fully healthy. Cole won his first Cy Young Award last year, thanks in large part to better outcomes on batted balls, but also posted his lowest strikeout rate since he was a Pittsburgh Pirate. I'm still putting him on this list, mostly because I want to acknowledge what he did, and because it'd be unfair to MLB Network if I took advantage of recent news. In terms of overall value, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. had a lousy 2023 by his standards. His 117 OPS plus was fairly run-of-the-mill for an everyday first baseman, and his defense graded out poorly. Based purely on past performance, he doesn't deserve to be on this list at all, but we also know the upside he possesses. Back in 2021, he was the best hitter in the American League and finished as AL MVP runner-up. One positive sign from last year? His ground ball rate and average launch angle were in line with his best season. This is a man who exists only to torment me. In 2022, I ranked him at number 41, and he nearly won MVP. Last year, I ranked him at number 5, and he took a massive step back. Nolan Arenado has played three seasons in a Cardinals uniform now, and he's only been a top 50 player in one of them. He's also heading into his age 33 season and just put up the lowest outs above average and defensive run safe totals of his career at third base. The only thing I'm certain of is that this ranking will be totally wrong. Just not sure how. We've got a new entry. This is Dansby Swanson's Foolish 50 debut. Over the past two seasons, he's arguably been the most handsome, I mean, most valuable defender in baseball, and although he didn't hit quite as well in his first year with Chicago than his last year in Atlanta, I kinda dug what was going on under the hood, like his improvements in contact rate and chase rate. He's ultimately a high floor, low ceiling player, but that's quite all right. Only six players on this list have been worth more F4 than him since 2022, and they're all ranked a lot higher than 47th. This is also the first major disagreement between mine and MLB Network's ranking. Ultimately, being a pitcher is all about run prevention, and no starter has been better at that than Max Fried lately. Since 2020, he's put up a 2.66 ERA and 162 ERA+, plus, the best marks for any pitcher with at least 60 starts in that time frame. He missed half the season last year, but also put up the highest ground ball rate and strikeout rate of his career when he did pitch. This all bodes well for his contract year in 2024. He's one great season away from a massive payday, though maybe not with the Braves. I'm a bit perplexed by future Hall of Famer Paul Goldschmidt. His performance has fluctuated from a 141 OPS plus in 2021 to 177 in 2022 to 120 last year, but if you assess him in terms of barrel rate, chase rate, or contact rate, he's been fundamentally similar in all those seasons, so it would probably be a mistake to drop him off the Foolish 50 entirely, even though he wasn't a top 50 player last year and is heading into his age 36 season. <laughs> more like Paul Oldschmidt. <laughs> I said, more like Paul Old. You can't fool me. I am intimately familiar with your game. You might be surprised to see Aaron Nola still on this list after a 4.46 ERA last year, but that's just how it goes for him sometimes. Over the last three seasons, he has a FIP in the low threes and an ERA that begins with the number four. I'm expecting those numbers to be more similar to each other this year, mostly because the Phillies defense that never treats him right should be better. There's going to be some serious pitching shakeups on this list due to many injured aces, but Nola remains ready to provide his usual workhorse volume. At this point, it feels safe to say we know who Bo Bichette is. He swings a lot, he hits for average and power but doesn't walk, and he plays shortstop, though not particularly well. Will he take a step forward in 2024? I'd love to see it. One aspect of his game he could bring back is his base stealing. In 2021, he went 25 for 26 on steal attempts, but was inefficient in 2022 and only swiped five bags in 2023, even with the new rule changes. Still, he's a top 50 player and only just turned 26. I value volume in a pitcher quite a bit. 
Innings are out, and Zach Gallen tossed 210 innings last year, plus another 33 in the playoffs. For the second time in the past two seasons, he finished top five in NL Cy Young voting. As many of last year's top pitchers have gone down with one injury or another, the ability to endure his workload grows ever more sparse. To me, that's what makes him more valuable going into 2024 than any other year of his career so far. He can do what few others can, and that's make 600 plus outs in a season, with 200 plus of them coming via strikeout. I like Pete, I really do. He was decidedly not a top 50 player in MLB by on-field value last year. His OPS Plus fell from 146 in 2022 to 122 in 2023, but there's important context missing here. His season was temporarily derailed after he was hit on the hand by a pitch in early June. The Mets were already scuffling at the time, so he rushed back to the lineup just 11 days later, but slumped for the next month. Even with that, he managed to hit 46 homers, the most of his career since his record-breaking rookie year back in 2019. Now, moving forward into 2024, he'll be a free agent soon. I'm giving Pete Alonso a mulligan, as he ranks almost the exact same this year as last year's edition of the list. Adolis Garcia has not just gotten better every year since he emerged as a surprise full-time starter for the Rangers, his approach has gotten way more sustainable. Besides 39 homers in a World Series ring, his 2023 campaign was punctuated by a sharp decrease in chase rate, leading to a 10% walk rate. He's also a gifted defensive outfielder, with one of the best arms in the league. Projection systems don't quite believe he's a top 50 player yet, as they have him pegged between 2-3 war for 2024. But I disagree. I think he's a star. I'm a sucker for a strikeout-to-walk ratio guy, and George Kirby struck out nine batters for each one he gave a free pass to in 2023. This is nothing new for him. After he was drafted out of Elon in 2019, Kirby kicked off his pro career with 25 strikeouts and no walks in low A. It might be easy to characterize him as nothing more than a command pitcher who fills up the zone, but his stuff can be nasty too. Kirby averaged over 96 miles per hour on his fastball last year, and his slider has big movement. 190 innings in just his second MLB season is something worth getting excited about, too. Believing in Luis Robert Jr. was a huge win for me on last year's list. I had him at 48th, MLB Network had him at 86th. Despite injuries, I knew he could have a monster season, and he did just that, belting 38 homers, stealing 20 bases, and playing some of the league's best defense in center field. He's getting bumped up 10 spots, but he's not rocketing up this list. Why? Because I didn't love the 29% strikeout rate after being a 19% guy in 2021 and 2022. Or maybe we can look at it this way. I don't have to move him as much because I was already right on the money about him last year. We always knew William Contreras could hit. It carried him through the minor leagues and it made him the National League starting DH for the All-Star game in 2022. But he was always seen as fringy defensively at catcher, at least until the Brewers lab got their greasy catcher's mitts on him. Last year, he graded out as one of the top catchers in the league in terms of framing and blocks, according to StatCast. And given that he's only 26, he is ranked accordingly and aggressively as one of the best overall backstops in Major League Baseball. I feel like Pablo Lopez was already a very good pitcher before he was traded to Minnesota. Between 2020 and 2022, he made 63 starts and had a 3.52 ERA and 3.48 FIP for the Marlins. But the Twins in driveline managed to tweak his repertoire and create a monster. More velocity and carry on the fastball, and a new sweeper led to 234 strikeouts, tied for third most in MLB. He now commands five pitches that move in five unique ways, allowing him to address any situation, regardless of the batter's handedness or the count. As far as I'm concerned, he's just getting started. I wanted to fit Michael Harris II on this list so, so badly last year. He truly was number 51 or number 52. Despite his excellent rookie season, I ultimately left him off due to his enormous chase rate and ground ball rate, as well as poor performance versus left-handed pitching. He struggled at the start of 2023 and spent time on the IL with back issues, but he finished strong, putting up an OPS north of 900 while playing gold glove caliber defense in center across his last 100 games. He also lowered his ground ball rate and strikeout rate considerably while doing much better versus lefties. Oh yeah, and he just turned 23. 
Kevin Gosman had a shoulder scare this spring. He's thankfully building back up and throwing bullpens and should be ready either by opening day or soon thereafter, so this ranking assumes he's fine. I thought I could big brain everyone last year by leaving him off despite a 2.38 FIP and 363 BABIP in 2022, citing his mediocre fastball as reason to believe his home run rate would inflate. But as it turns out, splitter go brrrr. In fact, I suspect we'll look back at 2024 as the year of the splitter league-wide, with pitchers like Kevin Gosman contributing. At the All-Star break last year, it looked like bubble butt Sean Murphy was making a serious case for being the best catcher in baseball, but his OPS went from 999 in the first half to 585 in the second. Examining the totality of his first season with the Braves, I think he might have gotten a bit unlucky. He was over 0.2 womps per whiff. Yeah, that's a real stat now. Anyways, Murphy simply won't have the volume of other top catchers in the league because Atlanta has a rare set-and-forget designated hitter in Marcelo Zuna, so Murphy will actually be off on his off days. Yet, on the flip side, I think it'll be difficult for any catcher to accrue more war on a per-game level than this Braves backstop. Do you see that? Total agreement with MLB Network. We both have Rafael Devers ranked as our number 32 player. Devers regressed a bit between 2022 and 2023 in what was a higher offensive environment overall, but under the hood things look pretty similar, so he'll probably be better this year. What's kind of difficult to square away with him is his defense, which is exacerbated by the fact that almost every other top third baseman in the league is either generationally good defensively or at least average to above average. Devers does have the advantage of youth still. This is only his age 27 season, which is crazy, considering he's been playing for the Red Sox for what feels like the past 15 years. Yandy Diaz has had people screaming at him to lift the ball for half a decade now. Poor guy. He was given the physique of prime Albert Pujols, but he just wanted to be Dustin Pedroia. And although Diaz once again had a single-digit average launch angle and ground ball rate over 50%, he did double his barrel rate between 2022 and 2023, hitting a career-high 22 homers last year. He made sacrifices in terms of his pristine strikeout-to-walk ratio to make it happen, but it was well worth it. He ended up being one of the best hitters in the league last year. You do you, Yandi. Alex Bregman, you know what he's about, plays good defense at third base, doesn't have the most raw pop but makes the most of it by pulling fly balls, and is one of the few hitters in MLB capable of walking more than striking out. Not much else here to say really, Bregman has one of the lower ceilings but highest floors of any player you'll find on this list, and he'll be a free agent this winter. Well, if I were bragging, I would say this isn't Logan Webb's first time on this list, and that I liked him before it was cool but I also feel bad about leaving him off last year's edition of the Foolish 50. In 2023, he followed the Logan Webb formula to perfection by significantly improving year over year his strikeout rate, walk rate, and ground ball rate. You think I care his ERA was a little bit higher? Not when my volume king is leading the league with 216 innings pitched. Also, the Giants defense should be better this year. Like a lot better. Is Gunnar Henderson underrated right now? Seems weird to say about a former number one overall prospect in baseball and reigning AL Rookie of the Year, but he's kind of flying under the radar compared to some of his current and future teammates in Baltimore. I know the Orioles are full of blonde boys doing what blonde boys do, but with more playing time at shortstop on the horizon, Gunner could provide a ton of value just by being kind of good at everything. That leads us to the other reigning Rookie of the Year, Corbin Carroll. He has a defining tool, and it's his speed. I even made a video about his base running on my main channel last October. Again, stop saying this is my main channel. At number 27, this is a bit lower than MLB Network's ranking of him at 18th. I guess it comes down to the defense for me. He's rangy in the outfield, but had the second worst arm according to StatCast. Still, his 6.1 F4 rookie season is the fifth best we've seen since 2000. Kind of funny how much a season's chronology matters, right? Trey Turner finished 2023 with somewhat pedestrian numbers by his standards, not quite what the Phillies envisioned after signing him to a $300 million deal, but he had an OPS over 1,000 after the faithful fans gave him his now famous standing ovation. Wouldn't we perceive things a bit differently if he instead went bonkers in the first half and struggled in the second half? That four-month slump still happened, you know, though it didn't stop him on the base pass, where he somehow went 30 for 30 on stolen bases. Unbelievable. 
Simeon was the other guy I really wanted to find room for on this list last year, but couldn't quite do it. He certainly made me pay, bouncing back from a just fine first year with the Rangers to secure his third third place AL MVP finish in five years. I think I weirdly penalize him for being an Iron Man. There are plenty of players who could be top 50 in war if I could somehow guarantee 753 plate appearances for them, which is how many Simeon had last year. Yet, at the same time, how many of them could handle that workload? Oh my, is this the fabled Chad plate appearer? Nobody understands Manny Machado better than I do. In 2022, I was the high man on him, and I was right. Then last year, I was the low man on him, and I was right again. 24th feels like a good ranking for 2024, and the folks at MLB Network agree. I'm very cognizant of the fact that he was beat up for most of last year. He underwent elbow surgery in October and will begin the season at DH before moving back to third base. Machado also has a weird every other year thing going on. If the trend holds, this is going to be one of the good ones. I was really stoked when the Astros extended Jose Altuve again. They have some big free agency decisions coming up in the next couple of years, but that was definitely the right move. Altuve has somewhat quietly been hitting at an insane level these past two seasons, as he's fifth in OPS Plus among qualified hitters since 2022. He is getting older though, and only played 90 games last year after starting the season on the injured list, so even a great performance in those 90 games means his ranking hardly budges, though he is my top ranked second baseman. Adley Rutschman is the number one catcher in baseball heading into 2024, and I think that's generally the consensus. He's good at blocking, he's good at framing, he has a good pop time, and he brings a patient approach at the plate that lends itself to a very high on base percentage. We love our high OBP catchers, don't we folks? Rutschman cut his strikeout rate quite a bit between his rookie and sophomore campaigns, but I also wouldn't mind seeing it come back up in exchange for more power. Hitting is a constant seesaw between contact quantity and quality. Boy, Zach Wheeler is good. Should he be higher on this list? Am I dumb? Am I big dumb dumb? It's higher than MLB Network has him, but that doesn't make me feel any better. Based on his ERA and FIP discrepancy, Zach Wheeler dealt with a Phillies defense that wasn't doing him any favors last year, but he should be better this year. In fact, he led all MLB pitchers in FIP-based F-War in 2023, then had a sub-2 ERA and 34% strikeout rate in the playoffs. He has an extension on top of it now, but one day we'll look back at his original five-year deal with the Phillies as one of the greatest contracts ever. Moving into the top 20, I just have a good feeling about Corbin Burns this year. I know the ratios and strikeouts and walks have gotten worse in each of the past two years since his Cy Young campaign in 2021. I know that. But he had a strong second half in his final year with the Brewers, leading MLB pitchers and stuff plus across that time frame. The Orioles only traded for one year of Burns with free agency impending, but I think it'll be a nice change of scenery. He was notably disgruntled after going through an arbitration hearing with Milwaukee last year. Even though he didn't play that great in his first year back from crashing a motorcycle into a pile of steroids, it's becoming very popular to project a massive 2024 for Fernando Tatis Jr. He's currently ranked 4th in NL MVP betting odds as far as I can tell, though I'm not a betting man. If he does that, it'll be because he improved his offensive game. I've done a deep dive on his data, and I don't really think he got unlucky to end up with a 113 OPS plus last year. I think that was just his process. The exciting strides were on defense, as Tatis moved to right field and immediately won a well-deserved platinum glove. Maybe a 150 OPS plus wins him MVP, considering the rest of his game. To say I was impressed with Bobby Witt Jr.'s 2023 would be an understatement. I remember watching his first season the previous year thinking, this guy is playing alright, but he's not as good as some of the other hyped AL rookies. What a difference a year makes when you're uber talented, right? Lower strikeout rate, higher walk rate, more homers and stolen bases, but the real key to maximizing his value was the defensive transformation. He went from negative 8 runs at shortstop to plus 10. That's like 2 war right there. Congratulations to Bobby Witt Jr. for becoming the first Kansas City Royal to feature on the Foolish 50. Do you think Kyle Tucker would be more appreciated if he had a more interesting name? Wouldn't he move up a bit if he had a cool name like, I don't know, Buttercup Dickerson? Tucker had an OPS plus above 140 again in 2023, the second time that's happened in three years, and he came as close as one possibly can to a 30-30 season. 
His F4 totals the past three seasons, 4.7, 4.8, and 4.9, and last year's could have been higher if the defensive metrics graded him favorably. Noted music critic Spencer Strider is the number one ranked pitcher in Major League Baseball heading into 2024. People might be taken aback by that given his 3.86 ERA last year, but this list looks towards the future. And one thing that generally correlates well with run prevention is, I don't know, striking out 37% of batters faced while only walking 8%, which is what Strider did last year when he led MLB in punchies and set the Braves franchise record. Don't forget that he spent spring training working on a third pitch, a curveball. So yeah, he's the best pitcher in baseball, but ranked at just 16th, as many of his potential competitors for that title are sidelined with injury, unfortunately. Hey MLB Network, isn't 25th a little disrespectful for Francisco Lindor coming off back-to-back -back six war seasons? A guy who had the highest barrel rate of his career while improving his walk rate and chase rate? A guy coming off a 30-30 season who continues to grade well defensively at shortstop. Time will tell, but Lindor's getting a bump up my rankings into the 15th spot. Even though 2023 wasn't the best year of his career offensively, I think Austin Riley could be in for a massive 2024, and that's because, according to the defensive metrics, he had his best season with the glove last year. Riley has worked tirelessly to be even a league average third baseman defensively, and that hard work is starting to pay dividends. Some might balk at ranking him as high as 14th, but he has finished top 7 in NL MVP voting each of the past three seasons. Julio Rodriguez wasn't happy with his sophomore year performance, and people found that funny. But it's true that his OPS Plus fell by 19 points, and that quite a bit of his production was concentrated in a three-week span between August and September. The most crucial element of his second big league season was reiterating that he's an elite defensive center fielder and frequent base-stealing threat. As a prospect, it was assumed he'd age out of those skills as he added muscle and power, but he hasn't. Pretty scary to think he's only 23. The Atlanta Braves will continue to appear on this list until morale improves. This time it's Matt Olson, who belted 54 home runs in a career year while also walking over 14% of the time. You know things are going pretty well when your slugging percentage begins with the number 6. Don't be too surprised if Olsen regresses a little in 2024. His 302 BABIP was a little uncharacteristic because even though he crushes the ball, he's a big fly ball hitter. But this ranking has that baked in. He was a top 5 player by F4 last year, but lands at number 12 on this list. Now it's time for my favorite player in the league, Jose Ramirez. In 2023, he had another Jose ramirez -y type season. He walked as much as he struck out. He hit 24 homers and won Tim Anderson, stole 28 bases, and played underrated defense at third base. I love J-Ram because he is a maximizer. God did not bless him with the prototypical baseball body, but he has turned into the best baseball player he can possibly be within that body. And while other third basemen fluctuate in production, he remains pretty steady, and as such is my top player at the hot corner. We're into the top 10 now. Let's kick things off with Bryce Harper, who is listed as a first baseman because, well, that's what he is now. He played league average first base last year while coming off elbow surgery and learning the position on the fly, so he'll probably be better there in 2024. Harper returned to the Phillies faster than anyone expected last year, and his power numbers suffered early on, but he OPS nearly 1,000 in the second half. He's still just 31 and poised to have his first fully healthy season since his second MVP award in 2021. Ooh, could this year be number three? As a hitter in 2023, Shohei Otani led MLB in OPS Plus and managed to be a top 5 position player by war, even though designated hitter isn't really a position. Of course, he won't pitch this year, so this is where I landed in terms of his on-field value as a hitter only in 2024. As a two-way player, he's the best in the game, and as a DH, he's still top 10. Even though Otani put up best hitter in baseball type numbers last season, I'm still not quite sure if that title belongs to him. I'd like to see him work on his gambling issue this year. He's only been successful on 70% of steal attempts the past three seasons, and it would be wise to act more selective on the base paths considering the Dodgers lineup now surrounding him. Mike Trout had a 263 average, 367 on base, and 490 slugging last year. For almost any other player, that would be a fine slash line. For him, it's a stain upon his baseball reference page. 
Beyond the obvious need to play a full healthy season, I think Trout's path back to relevance involves rediscovering the play discipline he showed in the late 2010s. Even though his strikeout rate was up to 29% last year, he made excellent swing decisions overall, so there may be hope for him yet. What's even more surprising is that he's quietly graded out as a plus defensive center fielder the past three seasons, which is something he wouldn't even really do in his prime. I still have hope, but this is a make or break year for him. I'm prepared to drop Mike Trout quite a bit if things go poorly. I'm going to stake my claim. I think Jordan Alvarez is the best hitter in Major League Baseball. He doesn't really provide value outside of his bat, but it is one heck of a bat. The fact that he's able to combine his in-game power with a sub-20% strikeout rate is preposterous. I would say it's reminiscent of David Ortiz. The only real complaint here is the availability. He's always a little banged up and still hasn't managed to eclipse 600 plate appearances in a season. I want that for him. I want that for me. I want that for us. Juan Soto had a good 2023, one that was in many ways in line with his career averages to this point. His ratios in walks and strikeouts weren't as good as they'd been, but he traded that off with a career-high 35 home runs, only 12 of which came in San Diego's pitcher-friendly Petco Park. Now that he'll be a Yankee for at least a year before hitting free agency, fans in the Bronx are dreaming about Soto attacking their short porch, but he'll have to pull and elevate the ball more consistently to do it. I think it's fair to say Freddie Freeman had the best full season of his Hall of Fame career in 2023. 211 hits, 59 of them doubles, even 23 stolen bases, because why not? If I could nitpick, his strikeouts were a little up and walks were a little down compared to career norms, but he continued to be elite at hitting the ball at optimal launch angles, leading the league with a 46.6 sweet spot percentage. He's Freddie Freeman. You know this guy. Big teeth, hugs people, weeps openly, and my top-ranked first baseman. With a 170 OPS plus last year, Corey Seager put together the best offensive season of any shortstop on a rate basis since integration. Full stop. It's a shame he missed five weeks early on because his MVP runner-up season would have been truly legendary if not. Seager, who was once again a World Series MVP in 2023, is defined by his approach. He manages to chase an average amount while being incredibly aggressive in the zone. I really think he's about as good a hitter as anybody in the league right now, and his competitors don't tend to play as high up the defensive spectrum as he does. Of course, that segues nicely into Mookie Betts, who is set to be the Dodgers' shortstop? Excuse me? In 2024. Mookie is coming off an excellent year of his own. Maybe not quite as good as his MVP campaign with the Red Sox back in 2018, but pretty darn close and, honestly, far more sustainable. Like, we can look at what Mookie did in 2023 and think, yeah, he can totally just do that again. A visit to driveline and a little more muscle gave him some extra thump, as he hit a career-high 39 home runs. And now, he's a shortstop in his age 31 season, because of course he is. Well, now you know who number one on this list is going to be, so let me just talk about Ronald Acuna Jr. His MVP season last year was sexy. 217 hits, 41 home runs, 73 stolen bases, and he did this while cutting his strikeout rate in half. Even as he struggled a bit in 2022, coming off his ACL tear, there were signs of a monster season lurking once he got more confident in his body, and that's exactly what happened in 2023. So, what gives? Why isn't he my number one player in MLB going into 2024 like he is on MLB Network's list? Well, even though you'd think Aaron Judge would be a big, statuesque oaf in the outfield, he actually provides more defensive value than Acuna. If the metrics are to be believed, we're talking about the difference between a negative right fielder and close to average center fielder, which is where Judge will play often in 2024. Judge, of course, had his own historically great season in 2022, which remains the most valuable season any player has had since prime Barry Bonds. And he was still pacing well in 2023, posting a higher barrel rate and average exit velocity than even his MVP year, as well as a nearly 20% walk rate. Injury is always a concern with him, but when he's been on the field, I think he's been the best player in baseball lately, and I expect that to continue in 2024. There you have it, my top 50 players for 2024. No need to even watch the season at this point. I just told you exactly what's going to happen through this list.
This year's Foolish 50 is brought to you by StatHead, the research tool from Baseball Reference. And big news, starting opening day, which is Thursday, StatHead will be free. All of the premium features will be free. You just need to make an account and you can StatHead to your heart's content. With StatHead, I can find who has the longest active hitting streak going into the season. It's William Contreras. I can find all the times a pitcher aged 44 or older pitched a complete game shutout. Most recently, it was Jamie Moyer in 2010. So every question you could possibly have about baseball, StatHead can answer it, and it'll be free for the next few days. And once it's no longer free, use code FOOLISH20 at checkout for 20% off your annual subscription. It really helps out with everything I do. I even have a tutorial in the description that'll show you how to use StatHead. Again, that's code FOOLISH20. Thank you, StatHead.